We're going to have Greg Berman um, actually speak now because I thought it would be good to kind of give you some pictures to look at. Um, you've just kind of had a heavy science talk about looking, you know, at math equations and, you know, understanding shoreline change and all that stuff. Um, so I thought we're going to kind of switch the pace and look at um, some 3D imaging results of what sea level rise impacts might be in one of our own towns, in the town of Falmouth. And Greg will explain the background with that, what they did to come up with this visualization tool, and how you might interpret the results. I really want you to pay attention to this. And then we're, go back, we're gonna end the morning before lunch with Jordan's talk on some more research going on about salt marshes, how they might keep pace with sea level rise. Thanks, Greg. Great, thank you, Tom. So, uh, check, no. <coughs> Go old school. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we received a grant just over a year ago uh, to create a three-dimensional inundation visualization. And that's a very fancy way of saying watching the floodwaters rise. And the things that we learned along the way about what exactly is a three-dimensional visualization, how they're made, we'll go over all that. Um, some of the uses and a lot about the caveats and things you should understand when you're looking at them. So there's definitely enough of these things out there. And what do they mean? Uh, here's one up in DC showing flooding, uh, a spot in Malaysia at a different profile showing flooding. And then uh, up in the corner we have uh, New York. I couldn't find one to zoom in on Giant Stadium, I was hoping. <laughs> But uh, all, all of these types of models are fill the bathtub models. And when you call it a model, you have to be very generous when you're calling it a model. There's really only two inputs to these things. We have ground elevation and we have inundation level. Inundation level. So how high are you gonna fill the water over what topography? So we thought we'd be pretty good. There's uh, decent data density around this area, we knew there was LIDAR, there was gonna be some more being collected, so we started looking at what's available. This red line over here is 2000 coastal LIDAR. This yellow is 2007 LIDAR, but everything in the middle did not have LIDAR. And there's a big gap right in the area we were most interested in. <laughs> um, uh, next slide or two, we'll get into exactly what LIDAR is. <clears throat> So we've got two kinds of LIDAR, and everything else was filled in with mass GIS, which is from the 1990s. And you can see each one has a different cell size, a vertical resolution, and a horizontal resolution. So really adding some pretty disparate things and trying to come up with an answer. But we thought, there's new LIDAR uh, being collected, about to be collected. We should be able to use that. And we're still waiting. <laughs> we went ahead with it because we had to get it done by a certain time. As it is now, it's a placeholder while we wait for the new LIDAR to come out. What LIDAR is, uh, coastal LIDAR in particular, uh, it's a light beam shot from an aircraft down onto the surface of the Earth. You can see it's gonna paint uh, back and forth, trying to get about 100% coverage. It measures the time difference between the light going down and bouncing back up to get the um, uh, delta to give you the, the distance and elevation. And this is possible these days due to advances in technology, a very accurate GPS, uh, real-time kinematic GPS, and very accurate uh, pitch roll and heading on the aircraft. Now the, what was it, Northeast? Northeast New England LIDAR project, uh, all the way back in January of 2011, started sending out these maps saying, it's coming, it's coming, and it's gonna be great, because Marshall County, uh, kicked in some money and we're gonna get very high resolution. Uh, one meter horizontal is close to nine centimeters vertical for the entire county. Looking forward to it. Um, we're still hearing soon. <laughs> Here's the map as of November and it's been collected. It's getting, I believe it's still being QC'd by the USGS and uh, they were expecting it in mid-January as of December as it's now mid-February. Perhaps they'll say mid-March, but should be delivered soon. And why do you want to use LIDAR for these things? 
Well, here's an example of an NED over on this side, a national elevation data set put out by the USGS. Order of magnitude is different between the vertical error. And when you're looking at that kind of difference in vertical error, uh, you get much better confidence with the LIDAR. This orange is an area of low confidence. Uh, they show this map of inundated area in blue, but the whole area is quite uncertain. When you look at LIDAR, you're saying, wow, a lot more actually is going to be flooded just from higher resolution data, and you're a lot more confident in most of these areas. Um, you never really see these low confidence areas when you see the uh, flooding visualizations, um, but you should keep that in mind. Think about that it, nothing's absolute, where we think this is going to be flooded plus or minus a certain value. Okay, so that's where our elevation comes from. And we also need our inundation. How deeply is it going to be flooded? From that, um, we took a look at some sea level rise projections. I uh, don't want to get into this too much. We had some great talks earlier already. But global sea level rise was about a half foot to two feet, and then about a half a foot of local on top of that over 100 years. Uh, it didn't account for the ice sheet imbalance back then. But these are definitely moving targets. <laughs> when we started the project, sea level rise has been revised several times already. Um, right here is the original IPC. Uh, then it bumped up back in 2009 to this swath. And then in 2011, uh, there's an AMAP on there, uh, a, a data source. But it, it, it's kind of, it keeps escalating. I haven't seen any newer projections that are showing uh, uh, lower values. And that's one thing we didn't do, is we didn't assign dates to the flood values. Uh, we just assigned the values themselves, and it's for the user to decide what that means. But we decided on one foot, three foot, and six feet of flooding, whether you want to call it uh, sea level rise for 100 years, 1,000 years, whatever you want it to be. Uh, it's been about a foot over the last 100 years. Um, so if you choose three feet, you might think, well, a lot of projections say that's going to be three feet over the next 100. Or if you just want to go with the extremely low, this is what it's been. It's 300 years for you. But one of the uh, uh, key things we wanted to include with this was uh, storm surge potential. And so we picked one storm uh, from 1991, Hurricane Bob, which was a Category 2, to include uh, taking a look at seeing what storm surge potential is already in some areas versus just sea level rise and uh, the potential for sea level rise to flood in additional areas. So when you're looking at uh, storm surges, uh, especially models, we use the slosh model. I think that was mentioned earlier, the sea lake overland surge from hurricanes. Um, and what uh, it was created by uh, National Weather Service. And what surge is, is it's the difference in the tide Let's say you have a normal tide right there, but the tide is here during the storm. The difference is the surge. So it gets added on top of that. Uh, just another uh, look at what surge actually is. Here's Hurricane Andrew approaching the Florida coast. Uh, the darker red colors indicate a higher surge. Uh, as it approaches, you can see this rotation uh, builds it up. And the, the real uh, uh, interesting thing I like about this uh, visualization is you're going to get drawdown from this area and it's getting built up over there. And as it crosses over the uh, uh, tip of Florida, you get a lot of surge uh, on the bottom. So very different for different areas, different geometries can enhance that. There's definitely other models out there. Uh, slosh uh, is not the best for a lot of things. Uh, accuracy is only about plus or minus 20% of a peak storm surge. It will account for the astronomic tides, tides created by the moon, but it doesn't really take into account any kind of rainfall or river flow. Not that we have huge rivers uh, uh, here on Cape Cod contributing to that, but it could, uh, uh, rainfall could affect some of the estuarine systems. This image is slosh. Here's the same thing with ADCIRC, advanced circulation. And here's another one called uh, FVCOM. And this one actually has a, a larger uh, global model informing a smaller nested model. And each one of these steps is much more computer intensive, time intensive, intensive, money intensive. And so 
as we were waiting for higher LiDAR anyway, we went uh, cheap and easy to begin with. And you can see here's um, one of these slosh model grids, and these are fairly coarse grids. They get finer in some areas, but add circ and FECOM are, are much, much finer grids. And uh, the cute acronyms part of the talk, uh, when you're dealing with slosh, we have meows and moms. What the meow is, is a maximum envelope of water. And there's many, many meows for a particular basin. Uh, the way it works is they're shooting, uh, pretending a uh, hurricane or, yeah, I believe these are all hurricanes, uh, approaching from a certain direction. And then this one is approaching from a different direction. And so you're going to get uh, slightly different surges. You can see a higher surge here than over here at the same time. And then when you're talking about the moms, what that is, is that's the maximum of all the meows. So you're looking at the worst case scenario for every point along there. Um, it's kind of like if the, and, and there's only five moms per basin. So each category hurricane has one uh, mom for this. We chose the category two to be closest to the above 1991 storm. Um, with uh, the moms, you're thinking that if the hurricane was gonna hit in the worst possible spot, and you're thinking that all the way along the coast. So it, it's a theoretically worst case scenario for every point along the coast. Um, it's mainly used for managers and evacuation routes. Um, it, it has some uh, uh, potential for these type of uh, flooding inundations because you, you wanna see uh, the worst possible scenario and that's exactly what uh, this would be. So with that, here is our visualization for Woods Hole. And this is all in a Google Earth environment. If you go to uh, Woods Hole Sea Grant website, uh, it's, it's uh, easily accessible on there. You can get in the Google Earth environment and pan along yourself. Uh, it doesn't get, well, I mean, it, it's all interesting, of course. Uh, the most interesting part is when you actually have the three-dimensional buildings and see the water rising near them. Uh, of course, this is the area with some of the uh, worst uh, data resolution. But here's our three-dimensional buildings we're zooming in on. And then you can advance it with different flooding scenarios, whether it be from sea level rise or uh, uh, a hurricane. Okay. And we say straight up front, on our website, this is beta. Um, if you wanna actually click on this, you're gonna have to go through a whole page full of caveats about what this should, shouldn't be used for. The fact that our data is not ready to be uh, uh, used for management decisions in any uh, way, shape, or form yet. It's not a forecast. Um, all it is right now is a way to visualize potential effects of sea level rise using current scientific data. Um, it's current as of now, hopefully with the new LIDAR, it'll be even better. And there's lots of potential for error and um, uh, looking at uncertainties. When you're looking at error, you can have error in the topography, you can have error in the tidal elevations, uh, especially with the different models. Um, you can have up to two feet of error, even when you have uh, very good LIDAR and good models. And that's close to some of these silverized predictions. Uh, with regards to uncertainty. Um, you're not looking at upland flooding. It's a snapshot of present conditions. That's one of the main foulings of the bathtub. It doesn't take into account beach migration, which Andrew talked about. It doesn't take into account sedimentation rates with the marshes. It doesn't take into account tidal fluctuations due to changing geometries. And so it's, it's assuming that things are gonna stay static over whatever time frame you're looking at. Um, it also doesn't take into account us. What are we gonna protect? How are we gonna protect it? Are we gonna nourish areas? Are we gonna retreat? Are we gonna uh, put gretty, uh, jetties or uh, revetments out there which are gonna change the dynamics of the system? So it really doesn't uh, take into account a lot of things. It can be a tool that managers can use to, to see some potential areas, but uh, please take it for what it is. When you look around, uh, here it is in a browser environment, you can have two conditions, calm or hurricane, and then you can set sea level rise on top of that. Here we are in a hurricane with 
uh, one foot of sea level rise. Uh, here's a, a town hall in Falmouth. And then you can, ed oh, sorry, wrong way. advance it to three feet and six feet. So, I mean, this is just a way to show that areas that would be flooded under current storm conditions, uh, it may have great, um, uh, greatly expanded areas being flooded in the future. Here is just calm conditions. So not category two in the village of Woods Hole with one foot of sea level rise, and you can advance it to three feet with six feet. And again, not a forecast, <laughs> just a way to look at it right now. Um, here is uh, the three uh, 3D buildings looking at uh, various scenarios, uh, the one foot sea level rise, and then when the storm surge gets on top of it, uh, significant areas become flooded. Okay, and another way to kind of get the point across, get people talking, uh, is to take images that people know. Um, here is a point in the village, and the software I use for this is called Canviz. Um, there's a lot of potential uh, for misuse. <laughs> you can uh, pretty much have it show whatever you want. The reason I picked this spot is I went there at about high tide. We have a little marker right there, and then I artificially increased the water level at this site. And when you're looking at these type of visualizations, keep in mind, this, you're not predicting human response. You're not saying that, gee, when the water gets up to here, I guess he'll just rebuild or the water will drain out. Eventually, decisions are gonna have to be made that are uh, going to make this type of visualization uh, not reasonable anymore. So here we are at normal high tide. You can bump it up to one foot of sea level rise three feet sea level rise, and then six feet of sea level rise. And the thing that's interesting is here we're looking at normal high tide, and boom, there's the category two hurricane. Worst possible scenario at this site. But we're already vulnerable due to storms. Uh, storms are relatively short term, so really, is it worse getting flooded to here, or is that going to matter too much more? <laughs> uh, things to keep in mind, gradual slopes increase horizontal flooding. Um, so that, that's the same point, a much more gradual slope on the top. And you can see, uh, if you have all your information perfect, a, more, uh, a larger horizontal area is gonna be covered by the same amount of water. Uh, but also when you have that kind of gradual slope, very small uh, uncertainties and errors can have a greater impact. Uh, when you're talking about storm surge, the geometry is very important. Uh, it's been modeled and if you increase the models, uh, you get a, a better accuracy, but it, it's still not perfect. Uh, when Bob hit, it had that rotation and it really funneled it right up into Buzzards Bay as uh, uh, Jeff's image showed. And without knowing that, here's the uh, 1938 image, if that movie goes over there. I'm not sure it will, actually. Um, so some of the other types of three-dimensional visualizations. Here's one for Groton. Uh, you can see the area flooded. They've included other information, like the amount of uh, uh, buildings within that, how much they cost. Uh, financial impacts of that. It looks great looking at it, but it's gonna take a long time to go through the economic analysis they did. Um, and I strongly suggest looking at, at the assumptions they made uh, for these uh, uh, damage values and flood damage values. So, is this useful at all, <laughs> what we've done here? Um, in some areas, the Woods Hole Village is like a bathtub. We have seawalls along decent portions, so as the water rises, it's not like the beach is gonna migrate here. So in some areas, it's gonna be more appropriate than others. Um, you're able to see areas that are prone to flooding, whether it's from storm or sea level rise. 
and you can see areas that are more prone to flooding with increased sea level rise. It could happen more frequently, and it could just be deeper in the same spot, and additional areas are getting. I didn't actually realize those were moving when I added them. I apologize for that. And it gets people talking and planning. Uh, one point I would stress, and I think it might have been mentioned earlier, what happens in 2100? Uh, the world is likely not to end, despite some predictions. Uh, we're not going to have some magic cure. Uh, all the ice sheets hopefully will not have melted by then. Uh, so when you do your long-range plannings, um, if you plan it out for 100 years, you may want to think about the next 100 years, uh, at least into the foreseeable future. And with that, I'll take any questions. And no, we didn't do, <laughs> we didn't have the money for photorealistic 3D buildings. <laughs> Well, that's um, along the lines of my question. If other communities want to do some sort of visualization, what's kind of the um, range of costs to do what you guys did in Falmouth? This was, this is doable for about 20K. Uh, when, and we went uh, cheap and easy because again, the LiDAR data doesn't support uh, investing more time or money at this point yet. Um, with areas where the data can support it, and if um, management decisions can be informed or uh, uh, encouraged, it, it could be reasonable to uh, spend all that more money. I know you've done a lot of work up in Hall, and you can actually do uh, three-dimensional uh, visualizations. Some of the Google Earth areas, they have uh, uh, pictures of the buildings pasted on each panel. So you can actually recognize the buildings and go through the town and watch the water rise. Um, that's not what we did at this stage. And you really need uh, a lot of buildings near the coast. Uh, we happen in, on the Cape happen to be a very uh, uh, less uh, densely populated than a lot of the cities. And you usually see these type of things within uh, larger cities to make more of an impact. One of the reasons I asked Greg to do this talk is with all the caveats, and he's really stressing <laughs> how this information should be, you know, um, interpreted and used with care. But it's that it's hard to wrap your mind around millimeters of sea level rise, or you know, just started talking about when you talking when you get to start and talk about a foot of sea level rise or two feet. It's more, it's more something that you can wrap your mind around. But how do you communicate that in a visual way to people? Um, is and I think that's very much along with, my question's very much along with Tani's asking or, or, or indicating. Did you actually share this information with the village and, and what kinds of, of questions, if so, what kinds of questions did it inspire? What kinds of, of um, was it met with skepticism? Was it met with, with um, a, um, some kind of charge to say we've got to start thinking about this? What, what, what did you get from that? If you did do it, what did you get from it? It is on our website. We have not done a huge push or press release, that kind of thing, just because I don't want, it, 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 it is what it is, but hopefully it'll be better in the near future. Um, no fault of their own, LiDAR data takes a long time to collect QC, everything else, but pretty much every two months, we've heard mid of, middle of next month. <laughs> So we, we've kind of been holding off until we can at least get the data and get cost estimates to decide if we are taking the next step. Um, so we, uh, we haven't had much feedback uh, from the town because we haven't really uh, tried to uh, publicize it as much as we would. Well, as a policymaker for Falmouth, I'm requesting that you share this data with the planning department, please. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Thank you. That's a selectman speaking. We'll go. Um, um, David, I'm going to ask somebody else just because just to give somebody else a chance to ask a question, and then we'll come back to you in a second. Oh, you have two back there. Yep. And then, um, have you? I know that in Woods Hole, this works very well with the bathtub model. Have you thought about what you would use to um, model some of the shoreline erosion in with the um, uh, inundation modeling? Or is any, do you know of anyone doing that? There are some folks working on that. It's 
orders of magnitude more difficult. <laughs> the, uh, the, I mean, you have to even get the, the science up to the right stage. Um, uh, Jeff and Andrew are working on a uh, NSF modeling effort, uh, working to see uh, how, uh, and again, you have to even figure out how humans are going to react to that barrier beach migration uh, to look forward in time. So you have to see whether it's economically feasible, whether humans are going to make the uh, uh, economically and environmentally, environmentally reasonable choice, and what that, that impact might have on any kind of barrier beach migration. Um, fill the bathtub is what we have right now. <laughs> I, I like the way that the, uh, the presentation goes with the colors and, and, you know, the whole thing is great. How does it m uh, compare with existing flood insurance maps? It does not include the flood insurance maps. It, it, uh, it uses different elevation data from the flood insurance maps also. So I, it, that's one of the caveats. Don't use this to see if your house is going to flood. And the flood insurance maps have possibly they're waiting for the, actually, they're not waiting for the LIDAR data. <laughs> They've been talking about updating these maps. They're well over 20 years old already. Um, hopefully, they actually, they were going to be in effect by now, but I think they're holding off for several reasons. Um, this is David Dell. I want to ask you, for the LIDAR data, how important is the ground truth thing to reducing the uncertainties in the level and how long will it take to fill in the data gaps that currently exist in the LIDAR data for Cape Cod? It's essential. <laughs> you can't have a accuracy analysis without the ground truth data. Um, I. The contractor who did the LIDAR data uh, did their own ground truthing. The USGS is QCing that, probably might be doing some of their own. I don't know. USGS isn't uh, here right now to uh, speak, but um, definitely have to have ground truthing. It, it's key. Um, all LIDAR that, <coughs> excuse me, uh, all LIDAR that is publicly, uh, publicly dispersed um, should have some kind of metadata. Uh, data about data associated with it, which includes that uh, ground truthing accuracy information. So y yes, it, it's key. We'll take one last one. Tom? Um, I think uh, one of the reasons that a lot of people in Cape Cod lost their homeowner's insurance was because of uh, uh, catastrophe modelers that, in, that the insurance companies use. Um, would I know they've done it for like s southern Florida and places like that after post Hurricane Andrew and so forth. Does that type of information help you at all? You, uh, do you have access to that or is, it, or is that all proprietary stuff? We haven't used that. This, this is just looking at uh, uh, the basic slosh model. Um, again, if we had the elevation, we might go that route. Uh, insurance uses a lot of different things. I mean, uh, a lot of the insurance companies are going to use wind as well as just storm damage. Uh, so I mean, uh, as well as just surge and uh, a wave impact. So uh, a lot of homeowners in our own Massachusetts, just because they live a certain distance from the coast, regardless of the elevation they're at, uh, don't have insurance from certain uh, companies. OK, I think. I think we're going to stop it there for, for Greg, but Greg will be around for the rest of the programs. If you have questions for him, please feel free. And, and also Jeff and Andrew, the other morning speakers, will be here throughout the day. So, you know, tackle them if you have outstanding things that you'd like to find out about.